Ah, hello, I hope you can see us. We can see some of you and I hope you can hear us. Give us a wave with your hand if you can hear us now. Oh, that's excellent. I'm, I'm just seeing four or five of you along the top of the screen at, at present. Um, but you should be seeing four of us and a polar bear. Um, and it's great to uh, welcome again Ellen, who, Ellen Simon, who was with us briefly on Friday evening when we began this series, and also uh, Lila Simon and Ben Scriven. So we've got two generations from the same uh, farm. And we're going to be hearing a lot more from them uh, about uh, their, their approach, not only to farming, but to the environment and a whole, a whole lifestyle choice, really. And some of the interesting choices we all have if we want to live sustainably. Um, so we'll be coming to them in a little while. But first, uh, this evening, as we talk in this series, Climate Crisis, What Can We Do in 22? Um, as we look at uh, the land and at food, uh, in what some people are calling veganuary, I thought we absolutely should hear something about a vegan lifestyle choice. And uh, though there's nobody speaking about that here in the studio, I'm delighted to say that we've got with us Lynn Birmingham uh, on Zoom. And uh, Lynn's able to tell us a bit about this. She is, um, well, actually, Lynn, I'll ask you to tell us who you are and what you do. Lynn, are you there? So, um, yeah, I am your token vegan here for the night. Hello. Well, yeah, you may not be the only, I think there are, <laughs> quite, there are vegans out there on Zoom as well. It's not only you. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, um, I turned vegan 32 years ago, so I'm old school. <laughs> um, and I think, Tony, you wanted me to sort of say why um, I decided to go down that route. Many, many it's a good place ago. to start, I think. Yes, please do. Um, I was vegetarian and I met my ex-boyfriend who was vegan and he explained the dairy industry to me, which I didn't quite understand. Yeah. Um, I was under the impression that cows just gave milk all the time. And when he explained to me the system, I just couldn't touch it ever again. And that was that really. And um, I've been vegan ever since. And it's been quite a challenge. In the early days, it was pretty ropey to say the least. So... I learned to be a really good cook. So that's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> I've got my own cooking business now. So, 32 years. And there's a, there'll be a link to that business, which is called Yomptious, um, for people to follow up if they want to after. Thank you. I just, so that's briefly the, your, the history of how you started as a vegan 32 years ago, which it must have been a lot harder then. It was. The soya milk was horrific. It was really thick and it tasted of beans. And I thought, oh, and I was an absolute lover of cheese, like a lot of people that really struggle. I think of the most people I talk to when I'm doing the markets with my business, I think most people are like, yeah, I, I like vegan food and I like eating vegetables and pulses. And, but it's the cheese. It's always the cheese. <laughs> but it's got a lot better. It's still not fantastic, but it's got a lot better. So that is definitely a massive stumbling block for a lot of people. Great. And, and how would you describe the balance for you now um, between different priorities in your understanding of your own motivation? I, I would think of, most obviously, ethical treatment of animals. That's, that's exactly health, what's done. health and nutrition and yeah. something about what's planetarily sustainable. Yeah, so my initial outset was um, I felt that I didn't really need an animal to die for me to eat. And it really, really bothered me a lot. And of course, that was 30 odd years ago. I and mean, it's got, you know, the amount of animals that die each year is just horrific. Um, and yeah, so I've still got that is my main kind of driving force. But then it started becoming more aware of the fact that it's actually the environment that's really suffering from factory farming, um, you know, the runoff into waterways, the land use, huge land use, huge water use. It's pretty full on out there. And, you know, there's the hormones and the antibiotics and all sorts of horrible things that factory farming is involved with. Um, and I've worked for conservation charities for the last nearly 20 years now. So as kind of like a member of staff working for one of these um, charities, 
I've seen the differences. And there was a State of Nature report that came out a few years ago, and it's 41% of British wildlife has declined. Things like the hedgehog, 95% decline. Turtle dove, I'm 51 this year, and I've never seen a turtle dove. Um, 98% losses. So they're huge losses, and I am passionate about wildlife and our, our planet and everything about it. And it really breaks my heart to see this. And, you know, the, the, it, the livestock industry isn't the only thing. Obviously, there's a lot of other issues, but it's, it has a huge amount of emission issues. Certainly things like methane. Um, I've put some little figures down, so you'll excuse me if I'm looking to the side, but basically, oh. um, yeah, um, there's 65% of nitrous oxide um, and 37% of the global methane emissions, which are more potent than CO2. So it's pretty bad. And if we want to feed everybody on the planet, there's just not enough space to have livestock to feed everybody. We could have a lot more food if we didn't have so much livestock. And I'm not, I'm not stupid enough to think the whole world's going to go vegan. That's never going to happen. But if everybody just cuts back a bit, that will really, really help. One of the things that people certainly used to uh, say when they heard about people going vegan is, oh, you won't be able to get all the nutrition you need. Has that ever been a problem for you? Uh, personally, I've never, ever had an operation, never been in hospital, never been seriously ill, never had a filling. <laughs> so I think I'm, I think I'm doing all right. But yeah, I, I get it. You, you do have to be a bit more careful. The thing is, I like proper nutritional whole food stuff i like my lentils and my pulses and nuts and vegetables organic of course um but a lot of people nowadays there's a lot of junk food out there you can eat bourbon biscuits there's burgers galore there's all sorts of stuff that's coming along now and i think some of the newer vegans have to be a little bit careful because they do tend to sort of live a little bit too much off the junk food. I mean, even McDonald's have got a vegan burger now. So, you know, you can still be unhealthy. You have got to be a little bit careful. And some people take supplements to help them with it. Um, but as long as you've got a balanced all round um, food, then you should be fine. Yeah, um, we all have to. <laughs> it's possible on all diets to end up just eating junk, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Too much of it, absolutely. Um, the the other thing is I'm aware that sometimes some of the, um, for instance, dairy alternatives have a pretty high environmental cost in themselves. So that there's an interesting, I mean, I think things are developing and uh, people are probably learning about that, but not everything that's offered as an alternative to traditional meat or dairy is all that great in, in environmental terms, certainly. But I basically will buy um, organic soya milk, which is um, soya grown in Europe. Um, a lot of the soya production that is responsible for deforestation, particularly in the Amazon, is really for cattle feed mainly, although there's obviously a little bit for um, vegan products, but it's a bit of a red herring, that one. But there are issues with almond milk production um, with bees um, affecting the amount of bees that are there when they harvest. So you've got to make your choices out of the lot. I have read quite a lot about it. Oat milk is the most sustainable. So a lot of people are switching over to oat milk. It's really good. It's a really good alternative. But I think because I'm quite old school. That's all we had. So I've got the taste for soy milk and I find it really hard with anything else. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's obviously issues. You've got to watch it with what, you know, air miles and things like avocados. But the general consensus is the plant-based diet is a lot better for the planet. Then what are you finding in terms of the growing popularity of veganism? Well... <laughs> It is quite a surprise after years and years of being like the total freak in every room. <laughs> um, I'm still a freak, but I am like not a freak as a vegan. There's a lot more of us out there. I think apparently half a million in this country. So it's still, a, we're still a massively small minority, but there's a lot more people doing flexitarian. So a lot of the customers that come to me, in fact, I'd say 50% of the customers that come to my stall are flexitarian or sometimes just full meat eaters that just like my food because obviously it's so good 
but yeah, um, I think if everybody makes small changes, it can really, really help. So I'm not one of these hardcore vegans that shouts at people in supermarkets and restaurants. I think the way to convince people is by showing them good food, education, and just kind of being leading by example, really. And there's some really great films out there that can help you make decisions as well. That's great. Thank you, Lynn. And we, we're going to link to not only to your, your business, um, but also to a, a, a vegan website that you've recommended for people who want to investigate more about this. Um, was I getting a quick comment from somebody here from uh, the uh, from Cameras Farm? Well, I, I just said we would say exactly the same. We, we, we see people who want to, who, who are eating a lot, a lot of eat, choosing to eat good meat and much less of it. And we feel that's very much the right way. Um, but that's lot, lots more to say about yeah, it. No on. arguments. Over no, so we totally almost all of that, I would say. You know, yeah. rainforest, deforestation, soy from tropical places. Totally. Factory yeah. farming in general. Is Factory farming and all the, the desperate effects of that and, and, and the cruelty of that as well. We, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely with you. <clears throat> Lynn, thank you so much. Um, feel free to stay on the line as long as you can, but I know you do have other things to, to do if uh, later on you want to join in the discussion, but we're going to mainly uh, focus on talking to these three folk for the moment. Okay, well, it was lovely to be a part of it. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye. So let's have the camera back in the studio, and uh, studio otherwise known as, formerly known as uh, the Quiet Room and Library at Athona. Waiting, checking. You know, on everyone Whether you can, else you can see us, can you? Yeah. Give me a wave if you can see us. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So, having spoken to Lynn Birmingham, turn back to Ellen and Ben and Lila. Um, so, could you give us a quick picture? Some people have stayed here and have possibly even come over with us visiting um, Tamaris yeah. Farm, but give us a quick picture of, of the farm. Uh, well, we're a, what we call a traditional mixed organic farm. So we've um, got, we do arable, so that's wheat and rye and barley. Um, and we do, we've got sheep and cattle, and we also have a market garden, so we have vegetables as well. Um, my grandparents started the farm in 1960, yeah. 1960 I think, when they the came to properly it started off as a little a sort of a small holding where they wanted to feed have good food to feed their children um and then sort of expanded from there over time um very much involved with the organic movement at the very beginning i did try and find out from the soil association where we stood in terms of the oldest organic farm in the country um they said that the computer system had changed about three or four times since the beginning so they couldn't actually track down when we were started. We, we did become registered with them, but we were probably the oldest organic farm still running in Dorset and certainly um, one of the three oldest in the southwest, um, which I think is um, quite a long, long time to be doing. That, that's all about certification. We were, we, were, we were working as an organic farm well before that, but so were other people. There were yeah. quite a few people in this part of Dorset, some very interesting, well, well respected people within the movement who flew from this area. Um, so we were, we were working with some fascinating farms when we started, uh, way, way back in my childhood I'm talking about. And uh, just in, for somebody who's never thought about it, an organic farm means what that you do not do? We don't use um, pesticides and herbicides, uh, fungicides, we don't add on um, artificial nutrients or oh, fertilizer. We don't add artificial fertilizer, um, and we we don't uh, blanket treat animals for things preemptively. So antibiotics. antibiotics, things like that. A lot of the factory farms will um, dose their animals with antibiotics on a regular basis. Um, which is basically um, taking the fact that they're, they're, they're looking after these animals away, which isn't appropriate, and therefore they end up causing a lot of health issues. So that's how they have to deal with the health issues for the animals. For us, we have 
um, lower stocking density, so we've got less animals per area, um, and that we keep them in what we believe is a much more natural environment than um, a lot of factory farms would be. Um, so we don't have to treat with um, any antibiotics or medicines unless an animal is particularly showing that they are ill, which as I'm sure we're all aware from you know, getting cold in the winter does happen sometimes. And in that instance, we are absolutely allowed to use things like that, but um, it's more carefully monitored to make sure that we don't uh, increase the antibiotic resistance that's happening at the moment. Absolutely. I, I think, sorry. The, sorry I was the, going to question your, your stark tone. You said, what don't you do? Yeah. I, in a sense, I'd rather believe what we do do. Do <laughs> you want to do that one, life? <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> sorry, <all day. laughs> um, We uh, have done a lot of conservation work over time, um, bringing, I don't, I don't know, we've, I mean, we've got a lot of, um, Lynn was talking about the dropping numbers of the various different animals and things like that. And um, I know that we've got, we have two, two gentlemen who come and bird watch on our farm on a very regular basis. Um, and I think I'm right in saying they've seen increases, Increase. yeah. increases in birds. I don't know the particulars, I'm afraid, of which birds, um, but. I sort of view bird watchers as like a, a keystone species. If you can support two <laughs> bird watchers Hold on. on your ecosystem, that's a, clear, that's yeah. a good sign. Yeah. And um, and a very a very sort of simple one to look at as well is glowworms. Um, I know a lot of people who say they've never seen them. I will get three in my front lawn any given night in the summer, quite I, easily. I've, I've never seen a glowworm. Until <laughs> um, I've never. No. And that's a particular one because they're particularly sensitive to pesticides and things like that and they can't um, because the adult forms don't actually move very far when they're, when they're mating, they recolonize very slowly. Um, so that's another sort of, yeah, another and you, and you, one I know about. And you've done quite a lot, I think, that many farmers would regard as um, peripheral and uh, not profitable. And not necessarily, mm. I mean, you do things for the environment. We do. Well, the, 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 thing, the thing we do that I was thinking of getting at was, was the looking at the soil. We, the Soil Association is what we're talking about. I mean, the, the, the original organic movement in this country was called the Soil Association. And our aim is to make sure the soil is working well so that the plants it grows grow well and then what eats that does well and then the people who eat the, the, the animals or the plants we produce do, are also healthy. So that, that's a sort of very, very simple statement of what, what, what this is, as it were, the positive statement of what, what organic farming is, rather than we don't use this, we don't use that. We don't do those things because they don't help in that respect. Uh, but also we wouldn't want to because they are dangerous and you never know what's dangerous until, until after the event. I mean, nobody, everybody thought DDT was brilliant when they started. They really did. Mm. Um, so. and, and that's, it's for the soil that you want to keep breeding animals. As much. Yes, there are other ways as well which we also work with. Composting plant matter. Composting plant matter. Yeah. But, but well, I feel like I'm going to say that possibly one of the key points now, but I'm say it anyway. Um, one of the reasons that we think um, having animals and being a mixed farm is when you um, when you farm, you're taking off. Uh, you're taking off things off the soil you know you're taking off things that, that we are going to eat um, and if you're taking things out of the soil you need to be able to put it back in a lot of farms do that with artificial fertilizers um, but that isn't the best way to do it so the other way to maintain um, a fertility cycle is to have herbivores on the land they eat the grass that grows very easily um, they're able to turn, you know, the sunlight that's in the grass, and they'll turn that into really good fertilizer for the soil. Um, so, um, yeah, one of the reasons that organic is a little bit more expensive than other products is because um, you have to take years out of productivity. You might have um, maybe a, um, half of the years that a field is growing something; it's growing a cover crop, which will then be ploughed in to produce fertility for the following year. And so you know you don't lose anything in productivity if while that cover crop is growing it's grazed by livestock so all of the land that i mean a small proportion of the land that we have is arable when it's not being when it's not producing food for humans it's producing food for 
insects and birds, but also for the livestock as well. So there's a sort of a, it's a symbiotic system. It's a reason that mixed farming is the traditional form of farming and you get horrific aberrations of agriculture when you separate livestock from mixed farming systems and you concentrate them and you put them in feedlots and that industrial systems. And then they become the, the, the wonderful manure that we, we sort of covet and we sort of, you know, custodians of becomes this enormous waste product and, you know, causes issues in people's rivers. And the real problem in people's rivers, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> Whereas I'll be damned today. We're fighting over for the arable and the, and the vegetables. We're making sure, we, you know, Rosie <laughs> runs the vegetables and these are and the manure that we would like to have on the on the um, on, on the arable ground. It's quite. Um, Give me more manure. Yeah, yes. <laughs> absolutely. And um, yeah, the the uh, I was going to ask you about the size of the farm. We're getting into the whole rationale, and that, that's fine. Sorry, sorry. Know, but let me just go back because give people an idea because it's grown, hasn't it? Yes. It started just as a market garden area. Um, yes. Yeah, the, the story, as I've heard it from my grandmother, is she wanted a small bit of ground that was just opposite their house so that she could grow some vegetables and keep a goat. And when she went to the farmer to try and buy it, he said, no, I won't sell you that little two acres that you want. So she went away and she went back and said, how about if I buy all of it? So she said, yeah, all right, that sounds like a plan. Those are the days. <laughs> and over time, um, they've managed to, uh, yeah, rebuy up the... The history of West Bexington, the village we're in, is a bit complicated, but they've managed to, to regroup the various different ownership of the bits of land there. And then um, when I was five, we yes. took on Cobden. Cobden here. Yeah. So that was in nine, 1995. Um, the farm expanded quite a lot into another 200 or so acres here at Cobden, which is um, surrounding Athona. Um, I just realized I didn't say the, the original farm um, in West Bexington is 170, 170 acres. Yeah. Um, so, so it pretty much doubled in size when we took on Cobden. Um, and then another five or so years later, um, in, in an attempt to, to look at doing more of the arable work, which had been increasing. Um, at that point, you spoke to the National Trust and well, took on the National Trust. Vein. Had Labour and Vane became Labour and Vane became available, which is right next door to us, immediately beside the Tamaris Farm, the original Tamaris Farm, became available, and we talked with them hard and thought carefully. And um, interestingly, they actually wanted us to run it in the same way as Cogden was running, i.e., just grazing but we were very keen we're talking talking to linda's now we were very keen to be producing um food for, for people to eat um rather than just food for uh, just food for animals and then people eating animals um so we were able to persuade the national trust i think i hope there's nobody from the national trust who disagrees with me out there listening but <laughs> it was that, that's how i saw it um, that we were we were we, it would be acceptable to them that we did a proportion of that as arable and that's what we're doing um, and we've 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 have since then been producing wheat, as I said, wheat and rye, and more recently barley for people to eat, um, which is very unusual. And we're also working at producing um, pulses, but we're finding it quite difficult to do. The pigeons love them so much that we can't seem to do it. Pigeons and pigeons and um, pheasants have had last year had every single pea we planted. Um, How frustrating! <laughs> lovely for them. Frustrating. <laughs> well, ironically, of course. Lynn, who we were hearing from a few minutes ago, her day job is with the National Trust. Is that right? I just yes. said that. It's all <laughs> <laughs> um, It is. Yeah. Um, and most of the farm, I mean, just to sort of summarise, it's about 600 acres. Yeah. And most of that is, is rented from the National Trust. Yeah. And we have a, a wonderful and working yes, relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. And, so a lot of that, fantastic. and a lot of that is permanent pasture. Yeah, the a lot of the majority. Those, and, and this is where you haven't really said about the conservation stuff very strongly yet. Yeah. Uh, that's another thing to say, is how, is how very strongly we've worked with both ourselves in the very long term um, and we, we had one of the very first, I think the very first of the Dorset Wildlife Trust Reserves was on our farm um, and, and over the, so my parents were very keen on, on working towards nature conservation from the very start. Um, when we had, and, and that developed through my childhood, watching things growing and, and learning to love the animals and, and plants that I saw um, and then taking on the National Trust land here at Cobden and has been a, a, a marvellous pleasure seeing how we've been able to help it develop from very poor grazing um, with very, very few species 
to a magnificent um, range of, of, of lovely flowers. I mean, some of you come with us um, on our routine um, June, for early June flower walk down here, and it's just a pleasure. Everybody loves it. and, and it, it, Time of the orchids and many other yeah, things. Yeah, orchids and all sorts. Yeah. Um, that whole, the, the area known as Cogden, the National Trust land, which is uh, just downhill from Athona and out to the west and east, um, had been intensively farmed by another farmer until um, until 1990, uh, until about 1990, it's probably uh, late 80s. Uh, late 80s, and then it had been put on set aside, which meant that uh, it was left to go fallow. Um, but it started off uh, in that at that time, as you say, with very little species diversity. It had been worked very hard and drained of <laughs> a, a, a lot. But it has come back like anything in my 26 years here as well. Yeah. Now, some of the folk uh, watching this will have seen um, on my video walks, seen me mm. passing um, your, and hailing you in the shop <laughs> uh, because you run a, a very small farm shop uh, that operates one morning, one afternoon a, a week. Um, but who are you growing food for? Does most of it or all of it stay locally? Are you selling at all into wider markets? What's that sense of your relationship with your customers and your end users? Um, we would love to be selling everything that we produce um, to the local community. That would be brilliant. Um, the market garden is four, three acres ish. ish. Um, and everything that's produced on that um, is sold either through the farm shop or um, a couple of shops, Fruits of the Earth in Bridport, Monmouth Pantry in Lyme Regis, Berminster, Berminster Fruit and Two Veg, um, and in the height of the summer as well, there's a lot of restaurants that have our vegetables. Um, so all of the veg vegetables um, go locally, which is really, really good. A lot of really nice restaurants around here. Okay. You'll see that it's cameras <laughs> from salads. <laughs> um, with regards to the to the livestock, um we would we would love to be um i feel like i need to explain terms we'd love to be finishing more of our own animals so um the the calves and the lambs that are born we do sell quite a lot of those off into the um organic more mainstream market so just last week our calves went to a farm in devon um that farmer will then feed them on his grass and finish them um, ready for mar ready for market. I don't know yeah. when. Um, we'd love to have more of that for ourselves to finish, but at the moment, um, the sales of of organic meat locally is not is meaning that we aren't able to do that. Um, but the flour, the 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 rye and the wheat and the barley, that all goes like um, that doesn't go locally. A lot of it sells locally, but we also have a website, so we can sell some of that. And do you, um, do you grind all the flour yourselves? Yes. No. Some goes to the mills. We send some off as stuff to, to... we sell. We grind. Oh. Oh. <laughs> we also yeah. sell it as grain to a lot of water mills in the southwest. Um, so Town Mill, um, if you in, in Lyme Regis, Otterton Mill, if you bought from them, that isn't necessarily ours, but they will say if it is, and yeah. definitely sometimes is ours. Yeah. Um, uh, and others. It sounds like you do so many different things, but mixed farming was the norm, wasn't it, in this country? If you go back 100 years? Less. Less than that. Less, yeah. I mean, it, my, my, an example is my, the farm my mother grew up on in Lincolnshire, um, which is unusual and still has both cattle and arable. Um, but, at that, but when she was a child, it had the whole range. Um, and she, is, she was born in 30, what, 1931, so her memories of a mixed farm and her, her, she watched with sadness as it became more and more and more arable. Uh, they do still manage some, they do some beef, but very little. Uh, and that's been, that's typical. Um, most of the east, the east of the country is, is arable, most of the west of the country is, is not. There's not an awful lot of arable around here. 
Um, and to be honest, we, we do struggle with it. It's not so easy here. No, I was also going to say, I, I, I think to be fair to the farmers who have decided to do just one thing rather than a mixed farm like we have, <laughs> it is easier if you do one thing and get very good at that. And then you have downtime within the time scale of that. So we go from having the animals in over winter, straight into calving, straight into lambing, straight into haymaking, straight into, cult into um, harvesting, straight into cultivation, <laughs> <laughs> straight into, like, there's, we don't get any but the good side of that, rest time. The good side of that is that however annoying the weather's being for one aspect of the farm, it's perfect for another part of it. Always. So if it's, if it's too wet for, for the haymaking, it's still great for the animals to graze and, and good for the market garden. You know. So it, it sort of swings around about a bit. But, but a life where you have, you have to be sensitive to those things and watching those things and adjusting what you do um, over time, I, I would think very, very carefully uh, in the context. Yes. Because, I mean, people talk about food security and you said about the peas yeah. all being eaten yeah. by the birds. Um, and presumably uh, some farmers who uh, farm more conventionally in the sense of modern conventional, in the sense of spraying things, mm -hmm. Um, would regard that as too risky to, to be in a position where you're going to lose a crop because you, yes. you, you don't want to spray And it. also, if, you're, if all your eggs in one basket, if you've only got peas, let's say, for that season, mm. you've got a problem. But having said that, you're less likely to have that problem because they haven't got the scrub we've got. We deliberately have, have scrub and, uh, and low-growing low shrub and stuff like that, which is a lovely place for these things to live. And we do it on purpose. We think it's the right thing and a lovely thing to do, but it does have its inconveniences. Um, yes. So it works all sorts of, there's a very complex web of things going on here. I, I remember being at a, a, a wedding and, I, and someone was sort of trying to sort of rib me about organic agriculture. He was a, a, a retired farmer of a conventional bent and he was, he was convinced that we must have had an aphid problem. And I said, look, no, no, our yields are terrible for completely different reasons. I've never, <laughs> seen, I've never seen lots of aphids, we just have lower yields because we're not putting on the fertilizer. But I think but there's so. never some plague of something creeping through the crop. Because we have good hedges. We've got hedges and invertebrates and birds and so on, but he just, he, he couldn't get his head around it. I, I can take that back a lot, that the, the aphid story, can I, I'll, I'll cap with one from a long time ago, if I may tell you. Yeah, please. Um, we, had, we had an arable farm as a neighbor. He had been a dairy farmer, but he wanted his time on the beach. So he'd, he'd go, gone to arable so he could finish. He used to, when he'd finished the, the, the harvest, he would throw his throw his summer hat in the, in, in the, um, in the, in the bonfire and, and, and um, and, and go fishing but um but he at one point was saying we've, we've got a terrible plague of aphids i've got aphids all over my arable um you know i want to get a spray this is back in the 60s um and i want to get someone out to spray from the air and my, my parents said no we don't want that to happen you can't do yours because it's too close to ours um wait and we had a plague of, 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 of ladybirds to follow and the aphids were all eaten up and they would have come from the edges of our farm because the our farm was able to support them when there weren't a plague of, of, of aphids they were able to support them because there were other things to eat there and, and, that, and we still work that way and we don't have aphids on our arable and the same applies to all sorts of diseases we don't have mm. because we've got so much variety mm. and then down at the bottom of your land it, it's it's right behind the beach isn't it and there's wetland there um, yeah. and uh, a rather lovely pond that i think you was is much bigger than the pond at home folks this is a small lake really but the, the, you dug quite yeah. deliberately didn't you tell, tell me the story of that tell me. Yeah. well the, the the big the big pond in west Lexington. we have dug an awful lot of yeah. ponds since that oh, one yes I know. um we've, we've... i'm thinking of the big one with the island <laughs> okay Fine. The, 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 the big the big point of West Lexington. Yeah, um, yes, we I, there was a there was a year when Maine's water was was the pressure was turned down because there was a problem with the water with, with the amount of water available for us, um, and so they turned the pressure down. And the adults were standing by the water troughs getting thirsty, which was very scary. So we dug a pond. Um, so that if ever that happened again, we knew we would have water available for our stock. Um, it's had, it, we also dug it because we want, when we, where we chose to dig it, it's right next door to the nature reserve I just referred to, which has a fantastic range of birds on it, um, but had at that time no overwintering, uh, no, no water, sorry, no over summer continuous water. So it wasn't so good for things which needed water for breeding in the summer. So this is right next door to it and it, and it does a lovely job for things breeding down there. It's very, very satisfying to see. 
I don't know if you had any particular in mind about it, Tony. Is that well, the, the remorse? The remorse stories to go with it. You some, want. some of our Athena <laughs> friends have walked there with us. Yes. Um, yes. There was one time recently when we rather naughtily uh, tried to cut through that uh, nature reserve. Uh -huh, where there, isn't, there isn't there's a no path. way out. No, <laughs> and I, 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 we <laughs> discovered why that. there was no path. It was a nicely idea. <laughs> um, when, when I was up to almost my knees in mud, we turned around. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, so, a, a little bit of a, of a window onto the life of um, an organic farming family. Thank you. Well, let's think a little bit more about organic food as a choice for consumers. Um, obviously, the, the first issue many people raise is going to be expense. Mm -hmm. That it does cost more. And, and I, so, how far can you see a time? when that's going to be uh, a likely choice, for instance, for the single parent struggling with two or three kids in a, in a small flat, or for, yes, people who, who are basically um, poor for what they can put into buying food. So it's a, it's a really difficult question because there's no, there's no simple answer to that. We live in a very unequal country. Yeah. Don't we? yeah. I mean, so. it's, 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 a, it's a matter of, of what you choose to prioritise, and, and not everyone has the luxury of being able to prioritise um, if organic food is more healthy, healthy food. I mean, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not a world in which we can, everyone can have the best of everything. Um, but if people, it, we, have a, we have a difficulty because it's also convenience food. And so, um, I, nasty example, Lynn mentioned bourbon biscuits being vegan, uh, and so she mentioned bourbons. My, my son, the first son, when he went to university, did some careful work on looking at just the calories, not other aspects of, of, of value, food value. He added up and he discovered that bourbon biscuits were the cheapest way to feed himself and keep himself not hungry. He didn't, he didn't use them. He was, a, he was a very good cook and got on with good food, but he did work, do that arithmetic. And that is quite terrifying, really. Um, but if people are prepared to, to ha, ha, prepared to or have the time to do cooking, they can buy. Um, they they can create good food. Not as it is not as expensive as you might think. Um, I, I haven't done the arithmetic on our. We, we should do the arithmetic on our um, our flour and our wheat. Um, but but the you spend an awful lot of money if you go and buy. Uh, an organic sourdough loaf from somewhere. It'll cost you four pounds for about 400 grams, something of that order. So somebody, somebody out there can answer me on that one, I'm sure. Um, you wouldn't spend that much on buying our flour. You'd spend a great deal less than that. You'll get, you'll get a kilogram and a half of flour for less, for about two pounds. So for you, so you can get your, your, uh, and of course the weight of the, the weight of the, um, the loaf includes quite a lot of water. Um, so you can get what four loaves out of that. So you're, you're down to maybe, maybe, and I haven't done this arithmetic properly, so don't, don't quote me, uh, but let's say you're on 50 pence a loaf. Now that's still a lot more than what 20 pence for a, a sort of loaf that I wouldn't want to buy, but people do buy. Um, but you're getting more nutrient from it and it's going to be better for you. So does that, that, that is one of the answers, but it's not a good answer because some people are also troubling, troubled with time to cook. And also skills. Time to cook and skills because we, yeah. we stopped educating people yes. on how to cook yes. a generation or two ago. That's right. It's, a, a, it's a real difficult thing. Some of the cheaper ways of cooking, of, of, of eating, are going to be usually more laborious um, or more, maybe a bit more esoteric these yeah. days. So, like, so we've often said if you, if you, we would prefer people if they, a bit like what Lynn was saying, mm. you, you don't have to not eat meat completely if that's. For whatever reason you, you're not prepared to do that you could just eat less and higher quality and that it's that if it's how you prioritize um different priorities and, and that's what <laughs> for instance that's what Bathona is gradually trying to adjust yeah. in terms of uh, the meat in, in our diet yeah. uh, we're, we're becoming much more careful about where it's come from and how it's been raised and we eat less of it yeah and and, and that's what we hope a lot of people will be doing but i've just there's one thing which i've been very sad about with the way the organic movement's gone in the last few years the last 20 or 30 years since it became much more mainstream it was when, when i first went to things like organic 
when it, conferences, they were tiny and there were very few people there. We were all thinking, how can we get to, you know, 5% of the population using, knowing about organic? Um, we now, everybody knows about it now. A lot of people want to, want to support it and want to use it and feel that it's good for, for what, they can, what, what they can do for the world. But, um, uh, oh, I lost my thread. Let's see if I can get back there. Um, but what has happened is it's become a niche thing, which is to do with being a bit fancy. So therefore, you don't get, um, if, you, if you go and look for organic meat, you won't get, the, the, for example, the cull animals. We struggle to sell our older animals, that we, which are perfectly, which are very good to eat and are very, um, and, are, uh, uh, and, and should be used. They actually often end up having to go into the non-organic um, sale pathway because the, 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 the conventional, no, not the conventional, the, the most common way of looking at organic is that it's a luxury thing and therefore you don't want that type of meat. Ah, oh, people mm -hmm. want steaks. People want steaks yeah. and the best roasts. They will, they will come to us for Christmas and buy their Christmas lovely meal, but they won't come and they won't get round to coming um, steering, routinely for steering, steering, steering stuff. Yeah. Now, actually, having said that, we have a lot of you do. We have a lot of you who come to us and eat, eat our mutton and, our, and, and so forth. We really do. And people who come to us especially to buy the offal, which is the cheapest stuff. And, and, and so we do have people who come for that. But the, that isn't the way organic food has been sold. It's been sold as luxury, and therefore, which is wrong, to my mind, horribly wrong. But it's how it's, it's happened. Um, so what people should do, if they have the, if they're, they're cash poor but time rich, and if you have the time and inclination, if you can um, find a farmer who you think is up to your own personal standards, form a relationship with them, and say, look, I've, I've, I've got a, a bit of room in my chest freezer, I'll arrange to buy a whole sheep or, or part of a cow in advance from you, and that's great for the farmer, it gives him a, he or her some financial security, and it means you get, an, a, you get a ridiculously good deal compared to if you were buying it piece by piece from a supermarket. And that way you can, you can eat um, a lot more for your money than you otherwise would do. And hey folks, it doesn't come as a whole half. <laughs> <laughs> it, has been, it has been chopped up. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Well, it's not necessarily from our farm, but for any, any farm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's very and, and, to your standards. Yes. And of course, if you do have the freezer sp space, somebody's, uh, Louise has been pointing out on, on the chat, of course, unfortunately at the moment, gas and electric, electric prices for cooking yes. are going to go way up. Yes, um, and it's tricky. Yeah, it, I don't it think it's tricky. Easy all, the, all these things are difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you. That, that's interesting about the meat, I think. You're, you are really close to your customers, yes. which, which must be great. Um, and you meet lots of them face to face. Um, what are you finding about the the trends, as it were, in, in their food choices? I mean, is, are, is, are customer numbers growing? They, yours? They, they grew over, over lockdown. The na nationally, they grew over lockdown. Um, yeah. I, I think, yeah. And, and, people's yes. and people's attitude people's, to food and environment. Oh, yeah. But we meet those constructive people who want, who want to be doing it, who want to be making a difference, mm. who want to be involved in what's making a difference. We meet those people yes. and we enjoy that immensely. And we, and we talk enormously, debate enormously with our customers. Mm. I mean, Lila's at the market every, every Saturday morning in Bridport. Not no. so, no. So the first nice. Saturday so. of every month. Um, <laughs> Not every Saturday. The first Saturday every month we have a market stall in Bridport Market. And, and, we, and we talk with people at the shop and we talk with people, uh, we, we haven't done this last couple of years, but we always used to be running not just the farm, the, the, the farm walk, but also a big open day um, and, and, and other, other walks. And we find people are interested to understand and learn and, uh, and, and see and experience and enjoy what we do. It has been really interesting being um, at Ripple Market because it means that people who wouldn't necessarily find us or see us because they're not necessarily actively looking for local mm. organic food, they'll walk past and be like, oh, what's this? And um, definitely I've had people who've sort of looked and gone, hmm, that's interesting. And then they've come back again the next month and they've bought, you know, a small thing of lamb chops or something. And um, yeah. it's sort of, one of the things I like about the market is I feel like it's been a nice way for people to decide to give it a go and see if it is actually you know whether they think it is more expensive and that kind of stuff 
um, but they can talk to me about it. They can ask me questions. You know, they aren't just going into a supermarket and being like, oh, but that says organic, so it's going to be more expensive. And I don't think I can be bothered with that. You know, we're able to discuss, as we are saying to you, why we feel that organic is important and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And I definitely have been having that kind of conversation with people in town. Great. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, since, since we're looking at the, the meat and not meat thing, I'd, I'd like to say we're also finding when we work at recipes and ideas, and we, we, we've discovered something brilliant recently, which is the barley. Oh, um, yes. we, 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 we used to, barley we had not as much use for as we should have liked. We grew it because we needed it within the rotation, and a little bit went to the stock. Um, but we've recently found we, uh, we, we, we imported a, a polishing machine for barley, so we can now um, take just the very little bit of the outside husk off. So it, but I, those of you who don't know, if you, if you, if you touch barley, it's scratchy. A, a barley grains are scratchy and you can't, really, you can't really easily eat them. So they have to have a little bit of the scratchy bits taken off the outside. But now we can do that and we can, we can mill that. We are really, it's a, it's a, from my point of view, it's a, another revolution in my eating. Oh, I love um, it. It's um, delicious. How, how are you eating it? What are you eating? Oh, the beginning, the beginning, the beginning of the day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. so um, you, we, we, have, we have it both milled as a flour and also um, left whole. We call it pot barley rather than pearl barley just to differentiate it because it is a much more wholemeal product. Whereas when you get pearl barley from the supermarkets, it definitely sort of looks like a very white um, Thing. It's like a white rice brown brown rice difference, um, but you can make porridge out of it. It's a traditional um, Muslim dish called talbina, which is really really nice and really really quick to cook and really quick. And to cook. Much, <laughs> really, much I think we're going to have to put <laughs> get a recipe. Yeah, they the should all be on, on yeah. our website. Um, yeah, I had a friend who's who's um, made risotto out of it. He said that worked really really well. Um, we don't buy rice anymore. I mean, we didn't much in the first place because we've got our own wheat we eat a lot more bread but um now that we've got our own barley we use it instead of rice um you know so in stews just as a, as a dish on the side of your plate i've done it in salads with um oh, what was that really good one during the summer leg of leg of lamb pulled and um cooked until it was pulled and then with uh board like beans, the with board beans it was really good oh, yeah. a salad with board beans um mm. You know, the flour is really good. Um, it's my go to now for making pancakes or batter or biscuits, cakes, anything. Um, also, interestingly, just sort of scientifically, it's also incredibly low GI. If you're in terms of your insulin spike, mm. there's there's compounds in barley that, that make it slower to digest. So if you're eating whole barley, it's it's, it's better in that way, better well. in that way as well. But, I think we're going to have to try some more of it here. I, I can see not. Oh, yes. Thumbs up for my colleagues behind the camera. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. And we, and we, did you say there are recipes on your website? There not should enough. be some. I've probably got more sitting on my computer, but I'll try. OK, them well, them. somehow we'll, we'll try and do that. What I'll, what I'll probably do, folks, for those of you, most of you watching, I think, um, get our newsletter. So I'll probably try and uh, put a recipe on with our newsletter oh, sometime in the next yeah. few weeks. Uh, when you're able to, to deliver it, I know you've got like, loads else to do. Um, yeah, that, that sounds great. Go on. Well, I was going to say, and, it, and it's not expensive. No. It doesn't have to be expensive. It's, it's, a, it's something which is relatively easy to make it. But yeah. how good oh, to be able to have something well. as a substitute for rice that hasn't had to come yeah. halfway around the world. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking it's, we're coming up to six o'clock. We've actually allowed ourselves two hours. Um, for this we don't have to go on till seven but um, there's lots to talk about i'm going to suggest that we see now whether there are any questions or comments it's from you there. folk out in zoom land uh, there are some coming through on the chat uh, let's have a look at those um yes there's, there's a question helen i don't know which helen it is is saying um is there any government investment or support for organic farming in any way. What's the situation about that? Yeah, yes, there has been. Uh, there wasn't for a long, long time. And then with, uh, and please, I'll, I'll talk about this stuff, but I don't believe it was right. Everything that's been done with the CAP has been questionable. Common and agricultural policy common, sorry, of the, of the EU. EU. Some of you may remember the EU. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, there has been, I think that there have been things done very badly, no, very, immorally by the farming 
lobbies. Okay, so don't don't think I think what I'm talking about is good, but I will tell you what, how some of it's worked, uh, and we have we have benefited from it. So let's not uh, I can't knock that, but it's allowed us to do things which I believe have been good for everybody, like 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 the conservation work. Um, we wouldn't have had time and energy necessarily for all of that. We would have done a lot of it, but not so much without without the, the, some of this support. Um, but um, it, the, there was no support for people who are organic until, and I'm afraid I won't get this right, and somebody else will know better than me, but I should think it was probably something like late 90s or early 2000s when the, the, the basic payment scheme, which, is part, which was the most recent iteration of the common agricultural policy, when that took over from the previous system, which had all been based on high production, the more you produced, the more money the government gave you. Madness, right? Um, but that's how it was done. Um, then they changed over to this also mad system of rewarding people for owning land, which is completely absurd, owning or controlling. Um, but at that point, when they changed that thing, they brought in the, the amount per hectare that a conventional farmer got was, was something, and the amount that the, that the organic farmer got was greater. There had been, a, 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 for a while before that, a, a, a money which brought you in, let me think, I can, I can probably date this because we were, we got it for bringing Cobden in. You no, idea of the sorts of things that, that they're paying for. They're, no, that's that, they were paying, they were paying ridiculously for acreage. It was, yeah. it was absurd and immoral. Are well, they still doing it? Yeah, but they're cutting it down. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I'm the one who's done the, the paperwork on this in the farm, and it's yeah. you know it's it's it's, it's always company because I, it's been convenient, but it's been bad. Um, Not exactly made of money, though, are you? Then? Uh, no, no. no. <laughs> we, we have an office with a nice view. <laughs> and when we, we when we Lyle and I were in London together before we decided to come down yeah. to be on the farm, and we 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 had reasonable salaries doing reasonable jobs there. And we thought, well, but we're still quite poor because London's a very expensive place, expensive place to live. And we thought, well, we can be poor in London or we can be poor back home on the farm. And you get to ride a horse and everyone's happy. So <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't really, it wasn't a difficult um, question to make. But, but the, 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 the basic farm, sorry, B, B, basic payment scheme, BPS, um, gave more money per acre to organic farmers and non-organic farmers. And but more, more valuably, um, there, there has been for quite a long time um, money coming in that was so, where you, you, you'll have all heard this, this phrase, public money for public goods. We have been able to get public money for public goods for a long time if we wanted to. Um, and we did. We, we have been given money to dig more ponds. We have been given money to build more um, to, 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 to grow more hedges um, and, and to plant, plant trees and various things like that. And that is now going to be made more available to more people. And that's a very good thing because then people will be getting, perhaps will be getting government money and doing, it, doing positive things that are, are valuable for that. And I, and I really heartily approve of it. It isn't yet organised. No one knows it's going to work in detail, but it is, it is a, a, a big change for the better. Um, the trouble is, it's still going to be, um, to some extent, um, acreage-based, hectareage-based, uh, which means that small part people who put a lot of time and energy into things will be getting, will not, will not be getting as much as uh, as, as people who've got large acreages and they're, they're able to do more. Um, and so it's another another situation where oh, there must be a good little one on this, Tony. So, so those who have shall be given. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, because uh, large acreages, they will have economies of scale yeah. anyway in what they're doing, whereas you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, not so much about us, we, we, um, people who are smaller than us. People who, for example, we, we have a marvellous market garden now run by Rosie rather than my parents. Um, and if, if that stood alone rather than as part of the farm, it wouldn't be getting it wouldn't be getting things for, for, for what is the minimum is the minimum for five hectares five hectares which is it's, at the moment it's staying at five hectares so so the minimum size your land holding has to be to get any of this money from the government is at least five hectares that's ten that's twelve and a half acres twelve and a half acres so as i said that's earlier one. rosie has got 
three to five acres at the moment which she's using for vegetable growing which is at the moment you know she's still working on building up but that is taking up all of her time if she had five hectares yeah she would have to be working on a different scale to try and do it and she's well, working really hard to, to do a no dig system to, to put it to put it in context she's, she's not just rosie it's rosie plus three people another one in the summer um it's quite a lot of people it's good it's probably it's rosie quiet. in two full-time so full-time full 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 time. Time. um yeah so it goes back to the question, the, the earlier question about um, the expense of organic food. Mm. The reason um, the reason that organic food is expensive is, is sort of on a theoretical basis is because other food is unreasonably cheap because it doesn't pay for the what they call externalities, the the pollution that it causes, the deforestation that it causes. It's not a full audit of its real cost. Uh, exactly to the so, planet, yeah. to to society, and even with those subsidies for the for the the ecological things and, and that sort of stuff it doesn't it doesn't make up the balance unfortunately so, so we've, we've found ourselves wandering into what is perhaps one of the, the silver linings of brexit if i speak as somebody who wasn't particularly well, keen on brexit we, we hope it is. <laughs> nobody knows the details of it but the idea of more money uh, public money for public goods um uh, helping farmers in in that way um one of the other things results of that of course is trade deals like the recent one with australia yeah and I don't know how far that's likely to impact on you, but it's going to impact on a lot of farms. And I wondered if you have a view about that kind of free trade. I, well, the, the main way from my point of view is the animal welfare one and the transport one, both, both, both bad things, because uh, British agriculture has very high standards. Um, and they may not look high if you look, at, if, you, if you look at some aspects of it. I don't think much of the... Uh, that's an understatement of, um, of, of pig and, and poultry management, but it's better than in other places, which is horrific, which is scary. Um, I, I mean, this is, um, and so, so I, I worry very much that, that being making those trade deals um, will is not going to be protecting the, um, the, the, the regulations we have. British have been above EU. EU is better than a lot of the world. I think we're going to see those standards yeah. I, I, eroded. Yeah, and uh, but that's another thing. It's all about people's choice when they're eating. Yeah. So mm. they can buy they can buy British stuff. I mean, it, it, it's better. It's a worry it's, that we have, though, isn't it? It's a very it's yeah. a worry. Yeah. We're worried. I was, I was just going to say that um, you know, looking at the whole climate change issue, which is sort of what we're talking about, the specific part of. I just have a fundamental issue with shipping things that we can produce here or in france halfway across the world you know if if, if i'm gonna if people are going to use um you know fossil fuels to do something that doesn't seem to me the best use of the fossil fuels well the best use of the pollution from the fossil fuels yeah that, that that's worse you know yeah um so certainly i mean we, we when when we do buy things that we don't produce ourselves which we do we aim to buy British or European, um, unless it's a very special occasion, in which case, you know, they, mm -hmm. I do like, you know, melons and mangoes and every now and again. <gasps> but we've grown melons. <laughs> we can grow melons and it's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, you know, you need clean warm microclimate things. Yeah, 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 we're right. really lucky um, with our location. Yeah, the, the, that kind of thing. we are, aren't we? we oh, we're yes. in the lovely part of England for this, yeah. this kind of thing. I do worry. Um, if there is a, a massive influx of imported meat of, of that is that is cheaper by virtue of the way that it's produced, that we could run into a system whereby all the people who uh, are concerned about animal welfare and the environment become vegans on one hand, and people who, for whatever reason, aren't concerned about that will just eat whatever they well, can get their hands on. Yeah. And so the people who are, we think, trying to thread that that straight and narrow path through kind of the, the, the difficult sort of middle ground become just completely disappeared because the, the, we're neither one thing nor yeah, the other. The gap between mm -hmm. a leg of lamb from you and a leg of lamb in the supermarket may grow even wider mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yeah, um, with, with predictable results. Um, and just watching one or two other things on the chat and we'll see if there's anybody else who wants to ask a question out loud there. Um, 
we have a question from Paul Fox who says, do you have milking cows? And if so, what happens to the calves? <laughs> we don't have milking cows. Uh, we only have beef cows. Um, in theory, me and my mum love the idea of having a small milking herd. Yeah. In practice, it is very difficult to do um, to to get enough yield from a from a milk cow to um, produce enough milk requires usually more intensive feeding than we do on our beef animals. But um, people are doing it with just grass. People and are we, doing it. If we it. were going to do it, we would. Yes. Th that would be what we did. And, and, we, and we've always we've had for ourselves over time. We we've, we've had milk for our own own consumption. We haven't always at the moment. We often have. We mostly haven't, but we do from time to time. Um, and we've we've milked off grass whenever we've done that. Yeah. Um, so that would be the only way we'd be prepared yeah. to do it. Um, in terms of what happens to the calves. Um, I would like to think that we would try and work out a calf at foot dairy system, no, which is something it. which is something that um, is happening in some places. So rather than what, what so calf at foot, foot, so dairies, um, and this is this is where you do have to look at the difference between organic and non-organic and decide whether or not it's okay, because actually um, we do we aren't there's a dichotomy between vegetarian veganism and actually I think veganism makes more sense if you're going to be worried about it because milk and eggs, which are the two things that vegetarians can eat, are in my opinion much more difficult to find um, good ethical quality of them. So um, a cow has to breed once a year to carry on being in milk. Um, so you will have a lot of calves that are being produced from that. In a conventional system, the calves will be taken away from their mothers less than 24 hours from after they're born um, and will be fed um, old milk or... The fed colostrum, colostrum. There's a requirement. Well, is there a requirement for conventional no, farming? There is an organic. They mostly do because it's so much better for them. So they do usually get um, colostrum, mm -hmm. which is the first milk, which is so incredibly important for their for their health, is usually is usually collected and, and from all the all the cows and fed back to the calves. Even in a conventional system, I would be they would be fools not to. Um, um, but but, fact, what you said, no, this um, is, it's a bit of a false dichotomy in that sense, in um, in that um, some of the the least open to industrialization and abuse systems of agriculture yeah. uh, are not part of the vegetarian's toolkit. No, they're buying bones from your butcher and making bone broth. Well, I haven't put you talking about calf food yet. Yes, it's just a calf food. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so conventional farms, the calves come off at um, less than 24 hours old. Um, in an organic system, they have to stay with their mothers for a minimum of seven days. Um, I imagine some farms will vary that depending on, on particular situations of any individual cows. Um, but a calf at foot system, is one where you are prepared to have lower yields, so less milk being given to you, the farmer. Um, I believe they tend to do um, a once daily milking rather than a twice daily milking. Yeah. Um, and the calves will live with their, with their mums until a standard weaning time, which is um, about nine months to a year old. Um, which is what we do. But they will be anyway. separated. The it's called the calf at foot dairy. <laughs> they, will be, they, will be se they will be separated for a proportion of that time. Um, I, I've been sort of thinking about how we would actually practically do that. And it's quite interesting to, 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 to look at the challenges of making that work. Because my experience is that if they, if they are within shout of each other, they, they join each other. They know how to get where they want to get. Um, but people do do it and it does work. There are some small dairies that are doing it and I should love to. Fascinating, really interesting yeah. stuff. Um, we've, let me just go to one or two of the other comments on the chat screen. Do you feel fairly alone in your organic farming in this area, or are you part of a wider community? And if so, what have been the advantages of that? We are right here. We definitely are quite alone. We've got conventional farms all around our land. Um, but as a general community, We've got farms further away who are, who are organic, who we know, but also a lot of smaller 
people who I don't know if they're registered organic small, still small holders. small holders and things like that. Um, so people you may know Five Penny Farm in um, Wooden Pits Pain. Five Penny Farm is, is where we go uh, each year to uh, and hire space for a day to uh, juice our apples, uh -huh. these lovely apple juice. Yeah. 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 Um, so we there's, quite, a, there's a community, around. but it is but sort of further afield. Yes, yeah. yeah. so if you think on the scale of West Dorset, or then the, yes, there are so a fair yeah. number of places there, you there know. Are lot, are there are a lot of small organic or, um, or, or people who work within the same principles. Uh, and there are some bigger farms, um, organic farms. I mean, Will Best in just north of Dorchester, for example, is, an, is a uh, he started farming. He started farming organically as soon as he as soon as he took over from his father. It was about 1970, which is you know in the scheme of things a bit later than that, but around there. Um, and he's he's been uh, a, a good neighbour to us. We we, we uh, he, you know we we ideas and, and support and stuff. It's always been a pleasure to have Will around. <laughs> It's quite fun with the with the age of Tamarisk Farm as an organic farm. Yeah. And when your mother was running it, the 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 turnover of of um the voluntary sort of holiday labourers yeah. that it had was almost sort of like well it, it means that when it, I you Lyra and I were gone to sort of like very niche organic farming conferences, there'll be a dozen people like, oh yeah, Tamarisk Farm. Been there, done that. Yeah, so been yeah, there, been there, there. Yeah. As we we are a minority of farmers in the country. But we kind of do all know each other. It's kind of weird. Yeah. There is a community, and I, I have to say that that um, partly through welcoming at different clubs, all sorts of voluntary labour, and yeah. for whatever reason, um, my clear experience and feeling whenever I am around you folk is that you operate the the Tamarisk Farm, the sort of extended family yeah. of Tamarisk Farm, not not all not all of whom are family. Um, are, are really very much a community. Yes, I, I don't know what the question was, was aimed at. I mean, whether it was talking about we had a farm around, but we, we're, we're very lucky. I mean, compared to other farmers who can feel very isolated, very much on their own. Yeah. If you think how much farms have had to grow, and 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 the farmer may the, the farmers the farmer may well be spending his or her time in the tractor by his or herself all, all a lot of the time, desperately lonely, desperately on their own. Um, we've never had that. We've always had people around. Yeah. Um, well, and it's just hard. Chat with the cow while you're in the, like, in, like this morning, you're being chat with the cow while we were bedding them down. Like, we, come on, we've got stuff to do. Stop talking about sweetie. cow. Okay, I'm going to a couple more of the, the things on the chat. Um, now, this is, I think it's Heather, Heather Godfrey says, I'd like to ask about the current change in farming subsidies in that money will be made available for rewilding farming land. Will this be beneficial to farms like yours that have already allocated land to nature? Well, so we don't know how they're defining it. Do we know? No, well. Okay. So the general well, thing is it remains to be seen so what the, actually happens. The, the rewilding as a theory, it comes down to quite a, a it is a, a big debate amongst sort of niche conferences we go to about land sparing or land sharing. So we, we have a land sharing system rather than allocating areas to nature. We, we accept a productivity hit and we view the entire farm as for nature and productivity at the same time. We try and strike a balance. Yeah. Or you can say, I'm going to farm the hell out of this bit of land and then set aside something for rewilding or conservation specifically. And so that is a, uh, a dichotomy that sort of like exists and we've we spoke to people who have done rewilding projects mm. um, and we're going to be hearing from a rewilder par excellence um, tomorrow uh, morning we, we had people from NEP here which is really nice it's very interesting to meet them and they're from explain where they're NEP, from NEP is the biggest oldest best established very successful and very very valuable and absolutely certain in terms of the the, the development of the of the, of the habitat um farm is in sussex somebody large is it, area is it it's, it's, it's it's isabella tree isabella tree is the best she, known she's written a, they, they were here because the book is very they were here something. because she's written a book and they she was reading from it at the report literary festival um the book i think is called wilding yes it's called wilding yeah. Yeah. Uh, worth, worth having a look at it's, it's, very, it's well worth having a look at it's very interesting and, and it provoked an argument on the farm because there's a chapter about ragwort <laughs> <laughs> extolling the advantages of ragwort and i had come to the farm as a, as a novice 
So I saw just a yellow flower, and I was told that apparently this was a demonic thing from outer space. <laughs> um, subsequently, having read Isabella's book, I am now a conscientious objector from eradicating ragwort from the farm. I will, I'm no longer pulling any of it. Right, and, ragwort and, and, can be dangerous to animals. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it sounds yes. like you and I need to have it. I'm, I'm interested. Let's skip the ragwort too, conversation for now. It, it can go on for a we while. We have ragwort. We have definitely have ragwort. But, but, yes. but ragwort is also a marvellous feed. For, it's a full of, 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 of pollen and nectar for, mm. for um, invertebrates. Very valuable. I mean, I, I, I'm a, I, and, I, I pull it. And even but, when um, we pull it, we've always left some bits of it yeah. to make sure that there's some available for... So, on our land, in terms of rewilding, our land is, is very messy looking to a, an, an ordinary mm. agricultural eye. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is sort of, in a way, already sort of slightly hands off. Yes. And we're, we're moving towards that further. We're planting trees in fields as well as on the edges of fields and things like that. But the question was, what, what has the subsidy working with that? And I have a horrible feeling that it's one of these ones which is going to be um, available. I may be wrong about this, and, and it, isn't yet, it isn't yet settled, but the last thing I saw on it appeared to be saying that it would be limited to large areas, and it would be a matter of getting, getting several farms together to make a big enough unit to make it work. Um, and that is very much how it needs to be for the rewilding to genuinely be effective, though so you've got a big problem because you haven't got the, the predators you need. Um, the, predators, the predators won't exist. But I have a nasty feeling it'll be only, it'll be one which is for those who have to be given. I have a feeling. I may be wrong. I, I hope I'm wrong. Well, because you need a larger state. You need a larger area. Yeah. Those of you yeah. who are archers aficionados will know that there's a, a rewilding patch there. It's too small. Yeah, it's in, in, implausible. implausible. Implausible on the archers. <laughs> Perish the thought. I'm, I'm trying to read uh, something on the chat there from uh, Keith yeah. Treves Brown. As a vet who was off a time a civil servant, um, I remember being mad, be, being, mad being forced. No, no. I, I, Keith, sorry. Keith, can you? Can we? Can we hear from Keith? Are you yeah, there? You can unmute him, Keith, sorry. if you can unmute and and just uh, give us your comment because I'm not able to read it at the moment. Mm. I I am a vet. I was for a short period of my career. I mean, I've been retired for twenty years, but for a short period, I was a civil servant. And we, uh, MAF, as it then was, um, Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, was, became forced against its will to produce something called ACROPS, which is an acronym for United Kingdom Rules for Organic Farming Systems. Yes. Um, and I accept what has been said this evening already, that organic systems do probably um, long term benefit the soil, but I do not accept, and the ministry did not accept um, then, um, that the food produced was any different from that produced under non um, our crops systems. So this is about whether the food is intrinsically better for you. Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. The, the, You're saying the, that scientifically the government doesn't accept. The, the, doesn't the, accept that. Did, or did not accept. I can, look, I've been retired for 20 years, <laughs> but at that time the f government did not accept that there was any evidence that the food produced was any better. But, so he's, he's, he's quite right in that organic in and of itself may not um, guarantee that something is nutritionally superior. Mm -hmm. um, it might, you, in, a way, in a way, organic is like a, it's like a floor beneath, beneath which you can't pass. So you could, you could buy food from a conventional farm that was as good or superior to organic, but they, were, but they could be a lot worse in, in terms of ethics, environmental, nutritional, the rest of it. So I, I would never argue that organic was superior in all ways. Um, when it comes to nutrition, I don't know a lot about um, vegetables and stuff, although there's some indication that um, things like salad greens, if they've been nibbled by insect predators in, a non, in an organic system, they produce more of these um, flavonoids and plant compounds that are antioxidants in us. <laughs> so if an animal never has any insect pests of any kind... 
Mm. Let's just say yeah. yes. Okay. And there's there's also suggestion, and I can't give you any way of verifying this, but as I understand it, organic plants that have not been given a surplus of um, of uh, minerals and um, fertilizer, they have to have a better root system. They're going to go and look look further for what they need to create and um you end up with a greater variety of the molecules specifically the one i'm thinking of is the gluten molecule and i think i'm right in saying that there is some evidence to suggest that um organically produced grain has greater variety of the type of gluten molecules and proportionally less of the one that we can't eat as well but i'm not i don't know that for certain i can't remember where i came across that concept um, um but the meat do you want to talk about the grass fed uh, yeah um on the meat side of things not all organic meat is grass fed so the organic isn't a good um pigeonhole for that um, we have we have been predominantly, and we have now moved to a certified system of grass fed, which is an organisation called the PFLA, Pasture for Life Association. Um, so if you if you can find a farm that's selling you that, then it means that the um, the composition of the fats in the meat are higher in things like omega three, and because they haven't been fed um, um, any imported food of any kind. So the fats also are absent um, some of the more inflammatory omega-6s and things like that. Now, we can't um, market that to the consumer currently because of trading standards. We can't say rich, as, a, as a rich source of omega-3 because it has to be above a certain threshold. And oily fish is clearly still superior. But the organizations in America are slightly further ahead of, this, of us than this. And they're working on systems to be able to allow the people to, to find out what meat is or isn't higher in omega-3. Fascinating. Um, I'm going to go to more, may I go back to more of the things on the chat? Or, well, sorry. I was only going to say that if you're interested in what the differences, what, what are researched and clear differences, the place to go is the Soil Association um, website, because they tell us very carefully what we may or may not say um, based on, on the research. And so we, we're very careful what we do say. And I did say earlier on, healthy right the way through, and I perhaps should have been careful when I said that. I, I, I was speaking my belief. Um, okay, yeah. thank you. I'm going to go to one or two more things on the chat. Uh, Jane Davis says, has anyone talked of food sufficiency and security? The UK produces less than it needs. We're a trading nation, we import a lot. We've got used to strawberries at Christmas. Christmas. Everything available the whole year. Uh, we have uh, less connection with the seasons. The children who don't know how to prepare or cook vegetables. Jamie Oliver did his big, did his bit. Um, food is meant to be on the school curriculum again. Uh, green leafy vegetable intake has barely changed in decades. I could go on. Yes. Thank you, Jane. Yes. Um, unless there's, I'll go down to one or two more of these. Unless you. I was just gonna just gonna make a quick comment is that we are very used to eating pretty much the same meal five days in a row. Um, our vegetable <laughs> consumption at the moment is kale, Swiss chard, potatoes, leeks, leeks because it's winter and that's what you can herbs. grow here. Yeah. And herbs. Yeah. Um, so you know we we it's what we it's what we are growing. That's what we that's what we on our farm are growing at the moment. Apparently we could have more. But but my point is we aren't eating tomatoes and bell peppers and oh, salad yes, yes. at the moment yes. because we haven't got those because they don't grow here in this climate at this time of year. And that is um, something that you have to, again, talking about priorities and choices, you have to make the choice if that is appropriate for you. We are quite happy eating pretty much the same stew five days in a row. Doesn't mm -hmm. bother us. We really but like we've made that decision. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to cook with I like to cook with tomatoes, but this time of year I use my stored apples instead, and it works very well. Yeah, and I've got stored apples. And, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, so that that's about about um, yeah, when, make, making decisions about what you're what you want. Don't, to don't do. use recipe books because then you oh, won't use what you've got in the fridge or what's in season. Just I look see at a recipe and, and I go, mm, that's interesting. I'll take the spice mix. And I'll see what I've got in my fridge. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm going to go for a few more of these. Um, Paul Fox says, we have odd box each week. So odd box, eat good, do good, stay odd. 
Um, I, I think then there's a, a link if you're interested in it on Box. I guess it's a company. Uh, farm fresh, colourful fruit and veg rescued from going to waste. Oh, ah, reduce food waste. Absolutely. A new variety of seasonal veg straight from the farm every week. And I know how keen you are on reducing waste. Uh, we were talking yesterday and you were just taking the leek tops back yes, to, right. to put into lunch because uh, I'm afraid I, like many people, just chuck away the tops. Oh, no. So you have to tell me more That's about right. that. I, I cut them off to sell the, the white with a bit of green on and took the green home for my soup. Yeah. Very good. Uh, are we any more chat comments there to um, scroll for me, I please, Megan? Ah, oh, here are a few more. Um, no. There's a, oh, uh, a couple of people same. going back about Odd Box and Paul yeah. saying some more about that. People okay. can read about that who are asking. Uh, the best thing, it's Anne uh, says that the best thing of organic veg is that it's seasonal and leads to more variety yes um uh, grass oh, and, and jane davis again grass fed may also look at monos unsaturated fats as well as omega-3s um it's the yeah, it's some uh, the, versus the omega-6 issue uh, big thanks to all tamaris for sound like you are onto a great thing okay um i wanted to ask you a little bit about um being as committed as you are to organic food um what do you do about eating out because i mean i know even as somebody i'm i'm not vegetarian um and i'm not committed to organic food but i do know that when i go out to a restaurant i look and think i have no idea where they got this chicken from so and mostly i'm afraid i swallow hard and decide still to eat it but um i try and choose my restaurants now uh, to places where I'm going to have a bit more idea of the provenance yeah. of yeah, what goes nice. into their menus. What, what, how, do you, how do you handle this? We, we don't eat out much. <laughs> <laughs> well, Partly because our food at home is very good. You know, yeah. if, I, if I want a luxury, I might just sometimes go and get myself a steak. Um, and it's quick and easy. And it's from our own freezer. Yeah. Um, but, but seriously, I, I have for many years, I, I, have, I have another life with, with, where I support childbirth and breastfeeding um, and, and I have gone to many, many, many conferences and study sequences on that. And I signed in as a vegan because if I signed in as a vegan, I've done that for a very long time because I, I'm not prepared to be eating food that isn't up to the standards I want. I know, you know, you, you go, you go to the hotel kitchen and say, can you tell me where these eggs come from? And they, they don't know. So I'm not going to eat them. Um, so that I've done that for a long time. I don't take it that far on the occasions when I do eat out, which is pretty uncommon. Um, but there's been a very nice um, uh, street food van coming around doing some very good things recently. I always buy the vegetarian because that way I, I, I know there's no chance I'm really stuck in Tony's dilemma of having chicken he doesn't want to eat. Um, I just don't eat it. We're in I eat fish. I like fish and I don't eat enough at home because you don't grow it. So I do buy seafood <laughs> local. I, I, I will go to one by, by if I, if I'm, I don't eat that often, as I say, but if I do, local sea fish, good. Yeah, it's a, a good um, choice. So yeah. we're, we're lucky enough to have a sort of like medieval peasant's existence. So we're in and around the farm and the village the whole time. Yeah. So if it's like, oh, I'll just stick something in the oven, slow cook that. It's, so it's much easier for us to, to not need the convenience of eating out. Mm. Because there's always something growing. Oh, we mustn't be holding that. You had a pizza the other day. I did have a pizza the other day. Yeah. <laughs> Only a little bit. That's because I was taking my brother to the train station and they needed to eat before they got on the train and that was easy to have. I enjoyed my pizza. You have to, we're all making choices. Yeah, I, I don't feel guilty about the pizza because it was, it's part of, you know, make, making choices as you go and I was with my family taken to the train station and they needed to eat something and that was the thing that made most sense. And, um, because you guys have grown up on an organic farm, in some ways I'm the sort of militant yes. outsider, <laughs> the, new, the new convert who's like extra sort of yeah. um, hardcore about all the different sort of environmental issues. So you, you didn't come from this kind of background at all, Ben? No. Oh. No, I mean I, I grew up in a village in the countryside but I didn't grow up like in the countryside, like like, <clears> it, like just being part of that and riding around it on horseback and yeah, you, you like, grew up in a, like a, you grew up in a commuter village. Well, I suppose, it, I mean, there would have been people who weren't a commuter in that village, but yeah, like I, you know, spent probably most of my teenage life on a computer, probably, you know, my, my, my father was a, 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 a physicist and then a software engineer and my brother's gone into that sort of thing. And so my family are very much of a sort of 
software computer bent. Um, and we're not the sportiest family either. So yeah, no, not a lot of outdoor or farming type pursuits. My mum had a vegetable garden, which she doted on const constantly. Still does, she, very she, successful. My mother is, was a vegetarian, like second generation vegetarian. So she'd never eaten meat apart from a spam sandwich by accident at a party once. Um, <laughs> so I think she was violently ill. What kind of party <laughs> serves spam sandwiches? It's a while ago. <laughs> I, I wanted to, uh, uh, there may be more questions coming in. Do keep putting your questions on the chat, folks. Um, oh, some more comments here. Um, one more. Often the vegan option is the best thing on the menu. It's so, it is so easy to roast veg. Mm -hmm. Yes, and often the vegan option will be. But I, I, I have to agree with Lynn's veg. point. I'm sure, I'm sure you'd get better things now in, 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 in hotels that aren't used to doing vegan I, I would spend a weekend thinking I need some fat and I need some protein because they weren't cooking fat and protein they're just giving me stuff which didn't have anything in it yeah right um you've got so so things yeah. are, things are definitely looking up it's a very good thing mm. I, I very much I, I we all very much empathize with um the vegan situation especially in the sense that because it does seem so difficult to source um food that is to a higher standard um, nutritionally, ethically, environmentally, that it can often be easier rather than walking around the supermarket looking at a packet of everything. Is this lime caught salmon? Is it farm salmon? Like, it can just be easier to just say, I'm going to give myself a blanket ban of saying no meat, and then I don't have to think about it. And I'm sort of liberated from the, the tyranny of choice. Yeah. And that can just be easier. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. But I think in context, and this may be off topic, Tony, to, because you've talked other things going on, I think in context we have to bear in mind that our diet is only a small part of our impact on the environment. Um, and th this is about climate change, or it was fundamentally about climate change. We talked a lot about the farm and about how, what, what's important there, because that's, that's what we do. But we also make a lot of other choices in our lives. And I think um, what we eat is only a fairly small proportion of our, our big impact. And we have all of us, to make choices carefully um, so for example you you see a lot of um, set, um, charity shop clothes in front of you except my shoes <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're handmade in top nest because I because I, um, but, but other than that we are either <laughs> no, we are I genuinely either charity shop or homemade not even yeah. joking no. nothing here has been bought new except apart socks. from socks socks, socks are Quite new, sorry guys. Um, yeah. and, and my my shirt was uh, was a, a Christmas or birthday present. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. so otherwise, except, I'm except with you. pleasure. <laughs> those sorts of things. Back to the, again, about the cost of organic food or whatever. But if, if you're if you want to buy organic because it's better for the planet and you're limited on money, there are far <laughs> there are far better lower hanging fruit. So I, I was I did a, there's, other there's things like, you can do to help the planet. <laughs> yeah, so I was looking words, at yes. I know, terrible. I was looking at the WWF website and have a, have a carbon footprint calculator. Yes. And I calculated that because I live like a medieval peasant, my footprint is about half that of the, of the national average. If I then changed myself according to their metrics from being a, a meat eater to a vegan, it only dropped it down by another five or 10%, depending on things. And that's with the assumptions of, of, of methane and everything else, which um, I don't really have time to go into that. There's, there's a big scientific sure. discourse on that sort of stuff. Tell, tell us a little bit about it. We have a bit of time. Go on. So, I think people are interested. Yeah. So, <laughs> I've written it's like go Ben, go Ben. Go ben. So, <laughs> carbon and methane both have an impact on the climate, and they have to equate the two gases in a single metric so that they can calculate emissions reductions or targets or your own footprint. So you can, ca so you can compare them. So you can compare them, but they don't exactly tally perfectly together. So if I, if I emit carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, it tends to stay in the atmosphere for several thousand years. And, and so even if I emit a small amount of it, if I continually leaking a small amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, I will slowly increase the climate's temperature. That's what we see. Whereas methane, although in the short time that it's in the atmosphere has a, has a disproportionate warming effect to carbon dioxide, because its residence time in the atmosphere is something like 10 years, and then it pops back down again into carbon dioxide and is reabsorbed by plants and goes around in a circle. In effect, the two behave completely differently in that um, fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions end up being a forever gas, 
and methane is only important if you're emitting more of it than you were the year before or the year before that. So you can't actually get a, if your number of ruminant animals and their methane emissions are the same this year to last year to the year before, the climate cannot change. And this, this is a very logical position if you look at the fact that cattle numbers in the world globally haven't really changed ruminant numbers as a whole for hundreds of years, but we're having a climate crisis. It's not because of the cows, it's because we're burning 60 well, million years worth of... Yeah. So it's, it's a much more complicated issue than is often portrayed. And so if you lump methane in with carbon dioxide without accounting for that nuance, you tend to view what are some of the most environmentally benign sources of meat, like a cow up on a hillside that never eats an imported bit of food in its entire life, as far worse than some horrible factory chicken that ate food that was caused rainforest deforestation and lived in a barn that was heated with gas. Yeah. Because it was a small amount of carbon dioxide, <coughs> but a very small amount of methane. And that carbon dioxide will hang around for much longer, doing yeah. so damage all the time. I've heard it described a bit like a, a bathtub, and if you imagine the bathtub is the climate, and the methane is going in, it's flowing in, but it's also coming out of the plug. But then someone added a new tap called carbon dioxide, and now the bathtub's just going to keep rising and rising and rising because the plug hole isn't any bigger, and then you get an overflowing bathtub. That's wonderful. I, thank you. I like analogies <laughs> like that, uh, uh, images like that. I really do. We, 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 we're coming, I'm just going to see if there's anything more on the, on the chat. Um, big thanks to all of you for a very interesting presentation. It can't be easy doing what you do. No, I don't think it is. We have enough trouble. We have enough trouble with one small allotment, says Heather. Yeah. And um, I remember a time when you you had a horse fall on your... Yes. yes <laughs> so that, that, that wasn't good, was it? Was, uh, you, mean, you, mean, you mean just before lambing when I was doing my elephant? Yeah, that's right. Part <laughs> time. Good timing, Mummy. And, and right. Helen, Helen says, Helen says, I am in awe at the knowledge and wisdom you hold as a family. Um, and, <laughs> and this isn't the whole family. Um, Adam uh, and his husband is, is not with us this evening. Um, but, and, and of course, Josephine and Arthur, who started yes, the whole thing off so. in, in and, and Rosie and the people who work with her. Yeah. And also, I was talking to my mother this afternoon, and she was reminding me of all the people, as Tony did just now, over years, many, many people who've joined us and, and worked with us over a very long time um, with great. Um, trying to work with the, 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 emotional knowledge, but benefit from having people around us, lots of people over a very long time. But it, it's interesting that I don't, it's, the, the, the implication is that, it, that it's hard work, and it maybe is hard work, but it doesn't, doesn't feel like hard work, it just feels like what you do. Yeah. And, 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 and it's good, and it's satisfying. It's a cycle of life. Yeah. Somewhat, a cycle somewhat. of life for human beings mm. within the cycle of life mm. of the land. Yeah. And, and the animals and the plants. And in terms of, I mean, if you think in terms of work, it's always changing, it's always interesting, it's always, there's always the, the predictability of the, of the next bit of the year coming on, um, and, and, and then rolling on always, and, and, and yeah, so much. So. And one of the things that, that happens with the seasons at Tamaris Farm, mm -hmm. except these last two years in a normal way, yeah. is that we from Othona, if you come to spend Christmas with us, uh, normally we've been able to take as many as one yeah. from, from our group here uh, down to the barn in the farm um, on Christmas house. Eve yeah. to sit around yeah. on uh, straw bales and it's, sing carols. Animals outside. Yeah, yeah. and uh, always some animals yes. just outside yes. in, in true yeah. state, uh, Bethlehem That's stable it. style. <laughs> uh, no camels so far. Um, but but that's, that's again uh, a wonderful part that the farm plays in, in the wider local community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for many of us, Christmas hasn't quite started yeah. and, until we've, we've been there. Will we be doing farm walks again soon? Yes, we will. Um, probably a limited number in attendance. We did the open day last summer, which I used Eventbrite for the first time, but that worked quite well um, to make sure we had a manageable number of people come to the timed events i'm hoping that we'll do the same thing for mm. uh a wildflower walk wildflower in the summer um meet the lambs in the, the, lambs the spring, the the lambs in the spring. spring. Yeah. absolutely i think we can do that more again now. To do that social distance when i think about that yeah yeah, yeah. there's yeah. lots of handling we yeah. think about that one it's nice it's it's we, we want to go back to doing a lot more um public events like we used to do before 
before COVID happened. Okay, we've got one or two more questions uh, coming up in here or comments. Um, is no dig gardening better if you're on a small scale? That's from from Dave. Our market gardener Rosie is. Yeah, so she's she's doing a, a no dig system which requires a lot of compost. Um, I, from my limited knowledge, and I do not grow vegetables. I'm very good at killing plants in my house. Um, <laughs> um, my understanding is that no dig is is easier better if you're doing it very small scale um, at the scale Rosie's doing it works she's got um, herself built full-time and then she's usually got one or two people out with her working and um, the scale they're on it's all done by hand they don't use um, big machinery to turn over the soil so no dig on that scale is easier for her because it means she doesn't have to worry about, about having to use tractors and machinery um, it also in many ways is better because you aren't disturbing the soil in the same way um it's another thing that we haven't spoken about yet but permanent pasture is a very good thing to have um environmentally for the quality of the soil um, and carbon retention, and carbon retention. retention. The carbon if you aren't turning up the soil you aren't going to be losing the carbon dioxide and all the carbon all those things so no dig is better on that as well i think it gets tricky when you start when same, you start scaling same, up, the same theories apply. I was just thinking, like, although we we we're not we can't no dig 20, 20 acres of arable a year, well, we wouldn't be able to import enough compost. Yeah. But I'm we we attempt to to till as little and as shallow as possible to get the job done. Yes, low to low till yeah. farming. Yeah. But yes. until no. But till. we have to address the fact that we can't because we don't want to use the chemicals and, and can't as organic farmers and wouldn't wish to under any any circumstances. Um, organic farmers are at a disadvantage um, in, in with respect to no till. No till is happening on large organic or large arable scale and i'm sure it's doing a really good job for the for the soil structure <coughs> and so on but it involves using um glyphosate yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, because you can't you can't you a can't weed, do weed that. Killer, glyphosate weed glyphosate, it's a total weed killer which you use just but you you put it on just before you go on with, with uh, and, and and then and then you drill through the through the dead weeds um, and it's a very destructive one, it's very bad for insects, it's all sorts of bad things, yeah. but it does have the advantage that it allows the, the soil structure to, to be better. And there's no so question that's... we need is more rosies. <laughs> there is that chap, um, we bought our ram from him two years ago. Uh, he has, he's trying to do organic... Wool. No, till yeah, wool. Yeah. Um, and this is where, you know, you get into um, scales of economy. He put a lot of money into uh, a weeding tool that is very sophisticated. So I thought, uh, so he, so he's he's doing he's got a drill which drills the the, um, the seed straight into the ground, um, so he doesn't have to plough it. And then he's got this weeding machine which he drives over every I don't know how often, but it's got tiny little cameras on it, and it is supposed to be able to tell what is a weed and what is the crop you're trying to grow i mean that is ridiculously expensive technology we can't in any way justify having that kind of thing and i have he has it i don't know yet i haven't spoken to him yet about how it's going i think he only had it for one year when we saw him but that is a we're with improving technology you sh we like i hope we'll be able to increase and improve um, no till, no dig techniques, so that they can be done on a large scale. And there are other other ways of looking at trying to do it. I, mean, I, I, on a, uh, I would be very keen. We have tried. We're about to try harder, um, doing that with a low growing layer of um, clovers. Mm. But whether it would be possible or not, I don't know yet. So, people, we're not the only people thinking about it. I love the way you're still you're experimenting. Oh, yeah. You're looking for new things to do. Yeah. What, what what's next for the farm? What, what are the new things? coming along the pipeline that you're, you're looking into? Well, we, we, we haven't, we've hardly mentioned the hens. They're not, they're not, they're not next, they're existing. They've only yeah. existed for a few years. Yeah. And that, that's, um, that's a good thing. I was, I, was just, I was actually going to um, Oh yeah, again, yeah, that's talk new about nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it you compare, a, a, even the best quality egg you buy in a shop, you compare one of our eggs and the colour of the yolk is just stark and obvious. Well, um, yeah. So there's something um, they're getting out there that's, that's different. 
Sorry, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just actually going back to meat eating as an issue in terms of climate change and animal welfare. I think we mentioned briefly that um, we actually think white meat is less good than red meat. So there's a lot of people saying, oh, red meat's not good for you, it's bad for the environment, um, you should eat more white meat. White meat being pork and chicken. Red meat, ruminants, are herbivores. They eat grass that we humans cannot eat. Pigs and chickens are omnivores. They eat more protein than, um, and they eat, you know, they eat grain. They, can, they eat stuff that we could eat as humans. So a lot of, a lot of farms are growing. I mean, this was mentioned, um, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn mentioned Lynn it about soy being right. grown to feed uh, ruminants in feedlots. That's ridiculous. We can eat the soy ourselves. Don't don't grow that crop to feed it to an animal to then eat the animal. That doesn't make sense. And similarly, you've got that with a lot of pork and chicken is produced very quickly by giving it very um, protein rich food that actually a lot of it should be fed directly to humans or the ground that it's being used to grow it should be growing other crops for human consumption or, or left, left as forest left as forest, or left as forest. Yeah. exactly um so it's, like a, it's a modern aberration of agriculture that could only exist with cheap fossil fuels because no one is going to get in trouble of sowing a field you know weeding it by hand scything it stooking it threshing it by hand to then feed that grain to an animal that would be yeah. insane <laughs> So only when you've got combine harvesters and diesel can you imagine yeah. putting animals in one place and moving grain to them. And container ships to carry it around. Yeah, and so exactly. historically pigs yeah. and chickens were, were the, they were these they really were useful um, dustbins. dustbins. Backyard yeah. creatures, you'd have one, you know, but that's, that's now, in the village. Since there was, which was the disease? The, the mass, foot, foot and mouth. Foot and mouth. mouth. So since foot and mouth, oh. it's now illegal to feed pig swill because of the if, if people weren't the careful and the way they sterilized it before feeding it, there was, a, there was those sort of zoonotic issues. Which is the end of a tradition that had gone for centuries. Exactly. But that wasn't um, a question. I, I'm, I want to go back to one or two yeah. of the things on the chat here. Um, uh, what do you think of James Rebank's work? You seem to be on the same page. Yes, Just a very quick the, answer. Are we happy with James Rebank's? We know about it. This yeah. is the, the yeah. uh, Lakeland Shepherd. Yes, yeah. 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 And, uh, I, I, all sorts of things I absolutely love about his work. Um, there's no, no question. I, I actually couldn't face reading this, the, the most recent book when it, first, when it was first given to me because I just thought he's going to write about the losses and the sadness of losses. I used, as a, as a child and a young, and a young person, and, and my, one of my, fir my first job, my first post-university job was, was doing a survey work in, 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 in West Dorset for the, for the Dorset Wildlife Trust. And I had a lovely time all across the marsh. You know, this is going to make me upset. Um, it, it, as he was upset in writing that book, um, Marshalldale was a beautiful place, full of the most marvelous little little corners of beautiful, beautiful flowers and insects and everything. You drive across the Marshalldale now. How many daffodils do you see? Wild daffodils do you see? How many of the griggledy grues, which they call, which is what I, I, a name I only learned in the Marshall Vale when I was about eighteen, um, the, the, which is a, a, a one of the orchids. Um, how many of those? There's such so much loss since I, I'm. I'm not. It's quite a long time now since I was eighteen, but it's it, it, in the scale of things, it's a short time for the amount of loss of the beauty and the variety across there. Um, and that applies everywhere. And, and he's writing about that. He's writing, hopefully, but it's uh, uh, the, the uh, pastoral. Is the name of the new book? Yes. Um, yeah. He's he's writing, hopefully, because he's talking about how he has he was able by good chance to, to 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 not move too far in the wrong direction as an individual, and he was. He is now clawing it back with good help from government-based uh, uh, government and, um, and and NGOs to, to improve his farm again in t in the terms that we see as improvement, i.e. The, the the biodiversity and the beauty. Um, but there's there's been a horrible dip, and uh, and and he. Well, yeah. Um, um, the, the yes. su such a loss. 
um, of many species, particularly yeah. plant species, well, and, but, and but, a decline but, but in insect species. And you see, decline in birds. you don't, you, you can't, you don't know that the hundred different diptera species that, that existed out there that doesn't, you don't know that they exist. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we, I'm not good at those. I know they exist, but I, I can't do them. No. And, and I can endorse what you say about the little wild daffodils on the Marshwood Vale because yeah. we did discover uh, this yeah. year, I, this last year, I saw wild daffodils in, in numbers mm. uh, not far from here by going up to the very far edge of the Marshwood Vale, yeah. which is an area that I visit from time to time yeah. and I'd never seen yeah. any anywhere else, used to be whereas you remember them all it over. It used to be all over the Marshwood Vale. Stunning. And, and uh, you know, you, you'd, you'd walk into a field to look at it and you would be in... 50 different grasses, three or four different orbits at, a, at the time you were there, um, li little corners where there were fantastic different, three different types of, um, four different, five different types of buttercup, you know? But we can, I mean, there, there are prospects of turning things around, yes. and there are some good news yes. stories, and we're going to hear yes. some of that, as well as quite a lot of passion about bad news stories uh, tomorrow with, with Derek Gow. I, this brings me to one other question that I did have in mind for you, because in preparing for this event, um, I've encountered people, and these are young people, and they're people working in this field, people very committed uh, environmentally, and, and that's what they're doing with their lives, but who are currently so depressed or distressed about the way things are going that, for instance, they didn't want to talk to me for these programs. Yeah. Um, and I, I wonder whether, whether you're finding that a lot, that, that you're clearly, uh, among other things we've said, you're, you're, you're within a supportive community. Um, and I think for some people, uh, trying to do their best when, when they're more isolated is particularly difficult. Yes. Um, so the contrast, yeah. I mean, you know, when we lived in London, you could, I mean, not environmentally, you see it as easily, but you see the contrast in wealth. And similarly, you know, it's very hard for us to feel hard done by if everyone around you hasn't got on a holiday this year either, or, or the last 10 years that hasn't got on a holiday and eats locally and so forth. So it's it's easier to have people around you who can um, motivate you to do the right thing. And it also seems maybe more normal. So maybe we're just in denial and everyone else around us is not like us. And so we feel better, but little do we know, it makes no difference. But, but we're lucky in that we are working, perhaps not as well as we'd like to be, but we are working in the direction we think is valuable. I think if I were in a position where I couldn't do that, um, I, would be, uh, I, I would be more distressed than I am. Um, if you felt more powerless to yes. be doing something and so that was many people positive are going to be feeling a powerless because it's very difficult to make the contribution. But um, Adam quoted a, a song at you, uh, Pe Pe Peggy Seeger's song. Um, if you can't, if you, if you can't be in the front line, be stand behind the ones who are. That's right, he did. Yes, yeah. uh, and I think that's really. I mean, you you were talking earlier on today. I don't know whether everybody is here now. Was there when you were talking about activism? Um, there'll be people who can be more active, um, more able to, to take, I don't know, risks with their with their actions. But 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 we can all be behind everybody who's doing that. And I think that that's a way of taking a level of power. But I think powerlessness is. I mean, you know, how do we influence governments? Mm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we're coming around to a conversation we were having this morning. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and actually, from that conversation this morning, you weren't able to hear it, but um, what one of our contributors, Martin, was saying very forcefully was actually, governments aren't going to be the determining factors. They can be blocking factors sometimes, mm -hmm. and they may need to do things that enable things, but it's, it's civil society in various ways. Um, that and 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 business as well that will be making the big differences. Part of the trouble with governments is that so so many of them have to be by the very nature of the case so short term. Yes. Um, and whereas it's and, and in particular we were talking this morning that uh, faith bodies mm -hmm. uh, throughout the world, massive proportion of the world, um, people are see themselves as members of some kind of faith community and where they are beginning to think much more constructively about how they manage their land, yes. how they invest their money, and so on, how they 
educate how they talk from their particular wisdom tradition, their theology, as it were, about our relationship with the natural world. Um, it is, it's these things in some kind of greater collaboration as time goes forward, rather than just trying to persuade governments to change, which are the, 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 the media inevitably focus a great deal on the governments and, and make us all suppose perhaps that getting government to change is, is the most important thing to do. But um, <coughs> certainly Martin's contention this morning, which I think some of us were very interested by, was that um, from his point of view at, at COP26, the important stuff was happening. That's Aside right. from that, as the discussions went on by people in um, NGOs and faith bodies and uh, business and education and health across the world. Um, so perhaps that's uh, something to, just to add into our conversation now. We're coming just up to seven o'clock. Um, it's okay. been fascinating. Thank you so much. And um, it, it says here, um, I'm just checking the, the, the chats. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Jane, remembering her mother who worked on soil analysis at Birmingham mm -hmm. University during the war. Um, she trained in bookkeeping, not science. <laughs> um, but uh, it's been great having you here, um, having all of you out there with us as well. Um, don't forget that uh, there's not only a, a, a donate button, if you want to make a donation in, in recognition of these things, um, but also uh, a whole screen, um, a whole page, web page, with details of the people who've been speaking to us and some of the organisations and books and so on that they've been talking about. Um, now, if you're not used to navigating to those things, um, possibly you're not reading the chat page here where the links are being put up, um, you would only need to go back via your copy of the newsletter and click through to the same page where you found the link to join in this Zoom, and uh, that would now also has a donate button on it. And that page gives you um, a read more line at the bottom that takes you through from it to the page with all the details of our speakers uh, and uh, their links. So I just want to remind you that uh, <clears throat> at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, uh, we have the last of these sessions for these three days and this is about rewilding and reintroductions we're going to uh, most of it will be actually watching a filmed presentation by Derek Gow um, have you met Derek any of you no I've or heard him no, um, no. but he, he, he farms in Devon no. and uh, his farm has all sorts of creatures that uh, I don't think you've You've got any beavers? No. No. no, 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 no. Not have rid of them. Eurasian lynx, all sorts of things on his farm, and he's involved in uh, rewilding activities um, elsewhere. He's he's written on beavers and and other aspects of rewilding as well, and is is a great listen. And we'll also have a chance for further conversation if there are things that um, people out there would like to comment on. Um, we'll we'll wind up this series of five Zoom sessions in that way. Um, and somebody else here has said, thanks so much for this. I love how Athona is extending its reach with these online events. Such a positive and important evolution of the community. Yeah. I say thank you to you. And um, we would be about to serve you some of your own kale <laughs> but when i went to the farm shop <laughs> on friday morning somebody had, somebody had the whole lot <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to say good night to you out there good night, good night. i say thank you again to megan and liz who've been doing the uh, uh, tech driving of this and uh, hope to see many of you tomorrow morning 11 o'clock and if you've missed any of the series we will be making them all available uh, on youtube in in due course so i think it's over and out oh there's a message coming through message from megan no it's just goodbye, it's goodbye. oh she's just <laughs> waving goodbye okay let's all wave goodbye night night everyone